I'm speaking with Dr. Ofer Fridman, author of Russian Hybrid Warfare, Resurgence and Politicization. Uh, thank you for speaking with me. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. So first, tell me how uh, you got into studying this subject and writing about it. Uh, well, uh, actually, this story uh, that how I started this uh, with this book and this research began in 2015 uh, when uh, two books uh, navigated their way uh, their ways uh, onto my table. Mm -hmm. uh, the one uh, was uh, published by NATO and it was called uh, NATO's Response to Hybrid Threats. Uh, and another one was published in Russia, uh, and it was called uh, Hybrid Wars in the Chaotic World of the 21st Century, and it was obviously in Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was puzzled, you know, because uh, when I read them both, I realized that despite the title, uh, which is more or less the same, mm -hmm. uh, and once you get two books uh, published on the assumably same phenomenon, you uh, expect to find inside uh, something like different, maybe different perspectives, because one one is published in the West and another one in Russia, mm -hmm. uh, different examples. But uh, I expected to find something uh, more or less similar, a similar phenomenon discussed. Like for example, you read about terrorism. If you read a book published in Russia about terrorism, or in the West about terrorism. It will be uh, different perspectives, but discussing more or less the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, when I read these two books about hybrid warfare, I was um, surprised because having the same title, they spoke about completely two different things. What is called in the West hybrid warfare, uh, or at least what was called by NATO in 2015 as hybrid warfare, uh, it's completely different in Russia. They call hybrid warfare, which I call in my book as Gibridna Vaina, mm -hmm. and I uh, purposefully use this uh, just to separate between two things. Mm -hmm. Gibridna Vaina means in Russia hybrid warfare, in Russian, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but it's com uh, something completely different. Mm -hmm. So uh, I started my journey from this, uh, and uh, I went into the uh, long uh, uh, discourse, uh, very rich discourse in the West. Uh, what is uh, how the whole no the whole no uh, notion of hybrid warfare uh, has been born mm -hmm. and developed uh, since it was first introduced uh, about ten years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and simultaneously, I went to, uh, into uh, I went to analyze uh, how Russians uh, how did Russians come to this understanding of Gibridna Vaina, their way to understand uh, hybrid uh, warfare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a, this was a, the start of my journey. So and this, realizing that they speak completely different language. So did you get your degree in this field? Is that uh, is this my degree in uh, politics? I specialize on strategy mm -hmm. uh, because I. Uh, uh, speak Russian, obviously, I specialize more on, uh, uh, on Russian military thinking, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on Western military thinking as a equivalent of that and making a comparison between these two. Mm -hmm. uh, so, no, it's not my degree about that, my degree more in a more general strategic studies. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, it's just uh, one of the cases that I decided to pick up because it was so interesting. And if you remember, uh, 2014, 2015, uh, especially in the Western discourse, this was the uh, peak of Russian hybrid warfare. Mm -hmm. So, and I ask because I'm, I'm curious if this grew out of, you know, how you do a, your thesis for your, your PhD or or if this was something that just came after you were done with your, your formal studies? 
Yeah, no, no, no. This is not my. This is not my thesis. This is not my PhD. My PhD was about slightly different topic, uh, unrelated to that. It was again. It, it was in the, my PhD was in the field of strategic studies, mm-hmm. and I used the different cases uh, of Russia and the United States and Israel. But this is uh, already after my PhD. This is not my uh, dissertation or something. It's mm-hmm. my. Uh, next project <laughs> okay so let me uh, ask about the book then can we start I guess in, in the little blurb about the book it says uh, it mentions the 1960s where, where this uh, I guess the obsession the blurb says an obsession f- with hybrid warfare started is that correct in 1960s yes in the blurb it says the 60s so I'm just curious where that you know what that comes from uh, I'm trying to find the blurb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's incorrect. Um, uh, yeah, can you find the blurb where it says in the 60s? I, I can read the blurb. It says, uh, Friedman contends that today's obsession with hybrid warfare is more to do with politics than conceptual yeah. novelty having been devised in yeah. the 1960s. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Now I know what you're talking about. So let's clarify uh, a little bit mm-hmm. what it says. The, the idea that the term itself, hybrid warfare, is relatively uh, new. Mm-hmm. It exists for the last 10 years. Uh, and the main question, which I also investigate in my book, uh, uh, is, okay, we have a new term, but actually, is there anything new? Is it just a new terminology, or it's really a new phenomenon? Okay. And once I establish that there is little new in that phenomenon, then you can say, okay, let's put aside the title. Let's see uh, the literature about the phenomenon which might previously went under a different title. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, uh, actually, when you kind of think about, uh, okay, what is the concept? What is actually meaning of that? Mm-hmm. You can easily trace it to the literature in the West and also in Russia, uh, back to the 60s, mm-hmm. at least if not before, because if you start to analyze the uh, the phenomenon itself, not writing about it, mm-hmm. but the phenomenon itself, it's as old as uh, human history. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have this phenomenon that has always been here, uh, and then we have a theoretical writing about it more or less all the time you can find some clues also in Clausewitz and even as far as to Machiavelli Mm -hmm. Uh, but then you have more politicization of that and you have kind of more more fragment writing about that and trying to conceptualize it even more in the 60s okay and now we have this uh, hybrid warfare, which is uh, everybody is obsessed with. Mm-hmm. Uh, but historically speaking, in a phenomenon itself, uh, as it conceptualized by NATO or by Russians, mm-hmm. there is very little new. Okay, so uh, I guess let's talk about. You said there were different. You found differences. Can you uh, compare and contrast? You know the, the things yeah, you found. Yeah. So when we're talking about hybrid warfare and. I will put it very straightforward. I don't like the term, mm-hmm. uh, and we can uh, we can speak about that later. Uh, but uh, there are three uh, three main conceptualizations, the, the three main concepts that c- come under the same title. Uh, so the first one was uh, the initial, the original conceptualization, as it was proposed by Frank Hoffman. Uh, and it was de- uh, uh, developed in the uh, in the U.S. military, mainly in the Marines, uh, since 2007, 8, 9, 10, these years. Mm-hmm. And it basically means uh, a blurring line between regular and irregular forces on the same battlefield. Mm. Uh, and it's important to uh, to say a few words about that. Uh, and there was a, a very uh, nice book uh, published by Williamson Murray 
about hybrid warfare in 2012, where he uh, criticizing this idea and saying, actually, look, uh, partisans uh, or irregular fighters have been fighting with regular fighter, uh, fighters uh, for thousands of years, and he's right. Uh, uh, the no novelty of uh, uh, of hybrid warfare back then in 2008 and 9, as it was proposed by Frank Hoffman, was uh, the novelty was that uh, we a we can see regular and irregular forces fighting on the same battlefield in the same battle space which previously they were usually fighting different battles mm -hmm. so partisans in the second world war were fighting separately from uh, red army uh, or in american revolution the irregular forces usually were fighting separately from regular forces and so on and so on mm -hmm. now we can see uh, them all blend together on the same battlefield mm -hmm. and the second novelty uh, was the technological one uh, so if we go in, uh, back in history even to the second world war which it wasn't so far uh, far away uh, the technology available to regular military and to partisans or irregular forces were more or less similar. Uh, and if you go even further, when you think about it, the rifles uh, of, uh, and the military technology of uh, partisans in, during the American Revolution, for example, were more or less similar to uh, what the regular forces had. Mm -hmm. Uh, nowadays, the technology available to uh, regular forces, to the armies, and to guerrillas or to insurgencies are very different. Uh, and once you blend them together on the, sa uh, on the same battle, it, cre it did create something new. Mm -hmm. But So this was the initial hybrid warfare. Tactical operational level it's not about strategy mm -hmm. it's about new uh, new battlefield and how deal with a new type of enemy on tactical and operational level mm -hmm. then in 2010 uh, NATO picked up these ideas and they started to play with it and by its own uh, very nature of NATO it's not necessarily purely military organization it also has political ingredients so they uh, try to uh, increase this kind of conceptual thinking to the level of strategy and bringing different aspects to that hmm. like economy information uh, uh, cyber and so on and so on. Hmm. Uh, then it was forgotten uh, in 2012, and it, it, since 2014, the the, the uh, crisis in uh, Ukraine and the Russian reaction to this crisis, NATO rediscovered this concept, basically saying that uh, hybrid warfare is uh, a combination of all possible hostile activities, whether they're military or non-military. As one of the advisors in NATO said, it's a combination of hard power and soft power. So basically bringing any hostile activity, whether it's coming in terms of tanks and bombs or uh, economy, uh, finance, diplomacy, espionage, uh, and so on and so on. All this is a hybrid warfare. It's a very big, all-inclusive uh, term. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the second one. Uh, and the third one is actually Gibridna uh, Vaina. It's how Russians define it. Uh, and uh, according to them, uh, it's uh, a set, oh, a mix of non-military means. So, according to Russians, Gibridne Vaina uh, doesn't include military deployment. Hmm. So, it's very non-military. It's diplomacy, it's uh, economy, it's uh, finance, 
information, uh, and so on and so on. Hmm. So we have kind of these uh, three different uh, types, three different definitions, three different understandings of what is a hybrid warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, tactical, operational, military, original one, non-military only by Gibridne Vaina, by Russians, or as uh, is understood now, especially in Europe, in NATO, uh, is everything. Mm -hmm. Everything which is hostile to us, it's a part of uh, hybrid warfare. So what would the Russians refer to a situation where, and you know, since they have in World War II the history of partisans, you know, mm -hmm. working al alongside soldiers, what do they refer to as that situation where soldiers are fighting alongside partisans? Uh, first of all, uh, when we analyze the history uh, of the Second World War, uh, partisans were not fighting al along with soldiers. Mm -hmm. Partisans were fighting different battles in different, spa in different space. Okay. They were fighting in the rear of Germans. So uh, soldiers were fighting on, uh, at the front. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not fighting in the same space. Okay. And it was partisan warfare, or we can call it insurgency warfare. We can call it uh, partisan guerrilla, whatever. Uh, and there is a regular war, uh, fighting. So it was. Uh, they were fighting for the same cause, but they were fighting different battles mm -hmm. in different ways and with different means, uh, uh, employing different methods. And there were instructions how to fight uh, partisan uh, warfare, and there were instructions how to fight regular warfare. Mm -hmm. So they just differentiate it completely then. They don't... Hmm. Yeah, and uh, also in the West we have uh, we have conce right conceptual thinking. We can uh, separate and distinguish between what is regular warfare and what is insurgency or partisans or uh, freedom fighters, you know, or terrorists. Mm -hmm. It's kind of you know, it's a matter of perspective. In the end of the story, they all employ more or less the same methods mm -hmm. of sabotage and uh, so on and so on. So. Did Hoffman consider that the irregular forces fell under the same chain of command as regular forces, or were they separate but just deconflicting? Say, uh, no. According to Hoffman, and he based his analysis on uh, mainly on the Second Lebanon or analyzing his bala, mm -hmm. uh, but then also bringing different uh, uh, some other uh, cases. But this was the main case. What he was saying is, uh, and I actually find the, his conceptualization the most interesting one, uh, for several reasons. One of them, it, um, it doesn't go up to the level of strategy. It's trying to analyze what is going on on the battlefield. What is the enemy that we face on tactical and operational level? And according to him, we have a mix of uh, regular and irregular forces who have different training, who have different means and methods to fight, fighting under the same command against the very same enemy, uh, employing different methods, uh, using different technology, uh, f but all of them fighting in the same space, in the same battle space against the same enemy, on tactical and operational level, and this is important. Mm -hmm. When we when we think about partisans during the Second World War, they were not fighting the same enemy. Yes, generally they were fighting the same enemy. They were fighting the Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. but they were not fighting the same units. Mm -hmm. They were not fighting in the same uh, space. So, so what is the practical effect then? These these differences that you found, what, what you know, what does it matter in the end to how conflict is is waged? Uh, well, uh, and this is what I argue in, in my book, uh, the, the, the problem with term hybrid warfare is that it means everything and nothing. It's completely useless. Mm -hmm. Because A, uh, different people, even in the same establishments, in the, uh, in the US or in Europe or in Russia, for, for, for that matter, different people understand it differently. Mm 
mm. depends what they have read before. It's so inclusive that you you can't understand what it what it actually means. Mm -hmm. uh, it has its own uh, perks of uh, being very uh, good in uh, for political purposes, mm -hmm. but uh, for understanding of what is the confrontation about and how should we counteract it or how should we take an initiative in such confrontation. The whole concept, in my opinion, is completely useless. It's very good for politicians mm -hmm. who want to uh, delegitimize the enemy or unite the ranks uh, among their voters or, uh, member or uh, members of NATO, for example, to create this kind of feeling of a big evil enemy. Mm -hmm. And it works on both sides. Uh, also in Russia is the same in my opinion it's the same purpose of the, of the concept mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of understanding uh, uh, on conceptual level what is going on it's completely useless and it actually it's not only useless it actually makes more damage than hell mm -hmm. for everyone involved or do you think no, it, it's, it's, in it's not it, again uh, it's not what is going on on the ground it's about what is going on between us and mm -hmm. what is going on between Russians with Russians. Mm -hmm. uh, if we analyze what is going on in the West among the NATO member states or uh, between different establishments within one state, between military and uh, politicians, for example, uh, we confuse ourselves. Mm -hmm. We say, oh, hybrid warfare, uh, Russians do hybrid warfare. What does that mean? Okay. Because inside ourselves, every, each one of us understands it differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same actually happens also in Russia. Uh, when they call, oh, hybrid warfare, the West is waging hybrid warfare against us. Mm -hmm. They also... Uh, don't have a common understanding uh, and this is before we actually go into the whole, uh, whole idea of why do we call it warfare why do we call it a war it's a confrontation mm -hmm. war it's a very specific clearly defined phenomenon right uh, when we at war we deploy troops and bombs falling from the sky. Mm -hmm. This is war. Mm -hmm. It's warfare. Uh, to call economic sanctions as a war, it's very nice for political uh, for political reasons because it helps to unite people mm -hmm. against one enemy. Uh, but it also confuses. It confuses us because once we say a war, we expect our military to do something. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that it's a, a purpose of military establishment or military organization uh, to defend our information space. Hmm. Interesting. And if it's not if it's not purpose of the military to defend our information space, then it's not a war because once we're in war, military should be responsible. Hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, and if it's if if we're not in war, why do we call it as a war? So, if we take the Ukraine crisis as an example, do you see that as as a situation where everyone just described what was going on um, it, it, improperly and at cross purposes? You know, both sides were just talking past each other, or you know, how would you? Can, can you use that as an example of where these well, yeah, definitions... The Ukrainian, yeah, Ukrainian case is a very interesting example. Uh, if we take, like, because all three different definitions of war actually can happen, actually can be, dis can use Ukraine as described and it will suit their definition. Mm -hmm. 
When we take uh, Hoffman's uh, definition of uh, hybrid warfare, which is operational tactical blending, then the separatists in Eastern Ukraine present a hybrid enemy to Ukrainian military. Because these separatists use, uh, they blend and mix regular and regular forces. Sometimes uh, there are some Russian forces there, so it's kind of, or Russian equipment there. So it's kind of a mix of uh, regular and regular. Mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, they present, according to Hoffman definition, on tactical operational level, a hybrid enemy to the Ukrainian military. Mm -hmm. When uh, we are talking about uh, NATO definition of hybrid warfare, which is everything hostile, then definitely Russia employs hybrid warfare. Mm -hmm. They use economic uh, measurements against uh, Ukraine, they use diplomacy, they use information, They some would claim that they also use cyber, and also some military ingredient here in uh, Crimea and also in uh, Eastern Ukraine. So yeah, perfectly, we can say that it also uh, fits NATO definition of hybrid warfare. Mm -hmm. And when we ask Russians, they would say, obviously, it fits also the definition of Gibridna Vaina, because uh, what the West does in Ukraine, uh, it's, uh, uh, and against Russia, uh, it's uh, economics and information and uh, all these kind of non-military me uh, means and methods mm -hmm. against Russia. And this kind of situation, it's, uh, I would say, it would... Uh, it, um, Uh, it would be fun if it would not be so sad mm -hmm. uh, uh, because it helps each side on the one hand to accuse the other side of um, uh, employing uh, hybrid methods uh, against them mm -hmm. but also simultaneously it allows each side to uh, fend off the accusations mm -hmm. because we understand hybrid warfare differently So, uh, whatever you accuse us, it's complete nonsense because we don't do it. So, it sounds like the Russia. so the definitions, you know, people would use them to say, okay, we've entered, you know, a period of, of war because we meet these definitions. It seems like the Russian definition is easier to meet, uh, to, stay, to say that you're at war because it doesn't involve military, it involves a lot of softer things. Does that mean yeah. does that mean Russia would be more willing to go to war over softer methods than the West? No, it, when you, when you say when you say war, do you feel, do you mean like actual war? Yes, like you cro like Russia could say they've crossed the red line because they've done these soft things that fall under hybrid warfare. We consider the West being at war with us. That that's what I'm conjecturing. Well, you have to you have to be very cautious when you speak about hybrid warfare or hybrid warfare in actual military, like real military actions, because in fact none of the militaries in the West or in Russia uh, officially recognize this term. Mm. So, if you go to the military dictionaries, which will define you regular warfare, irregular warfare and so on and so on, mm -hmm. you would not find hybrid warfare there. Hmm. Mili uh, if you go to the uh, uh, US military dictionary, you will not find hybrid warfare there. If you go to the Russian uh, military dictionary, you will not find hybrid warfare there. Hmm. It's not, a co as I said, for military, military, uh, uh, all military, and I served in the military by myself for 15 years. Uh, military are very professional, pragmatic, uh, conceptual institutions. Mm -hmm. They want to have definitions for very clear phenomenon to which they will have to find solutions. Military is not responsible for non-military Uh, uh, activities. Mm -hmm. So for military, it's very uh, it's very confusing because 
we call it, people call it, journalists call it, politicians call it a war. Mm -hmm. But it's not under the responsibility of the military, and I'm not sure that we actually want our military to be responsible for that. Right. Uh, to solve the problem. Okay. Okay, so now I understand better the things you were saying at the start. Um, make, make more sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems more a tool of the politician. It seems a tool of politicians, and you, as you say, journalists. Yeah, I mean, and this is and this is why the book is called politicization. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, the politicians uh, found it very helpful uh, this term mm -hmm. because it, because it allows them uh, to take any hostile action conducted by adversary. And call it a war. Mm -hmm. And once uh, uh, people are told that they are at war, uh, they, uh, whether people in general like electorate or uh, decision makers, uh, their um, uh, their readiness to do something about increases significantly. Yeah. Hmm. So, can you tell me how you uh, researched this book? Did, did you interview for the? Did your research? Did you interview people? You know, what did you consult? Uh, I I conducted several interviews, but uh, the uh, the book, the main purpose of the book, was actually to trace the discourses. Mm -hmm. So it involved much reading of uh, publications and. Uh, uh, for example, uh, how the understanding of hybrid warfare in the West have transformed through the years. Mm -hmm. So initially it meant something A, and then it uh, uh, have become to be something A++++. plus 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 plus. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it involved much reading of uh, publications, whether there were books or articles or official documents, uh, which discussed what is hybrid warfare, how we understand it, uh, what should be done, why, sh why this, why should we do that, uh, uh, and so on and so on. And the same uh, on the Russian side. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is interesting is that on the Russian side. Uh, all this discourse of Gibridne Vaina, it's relatively new, it's actually began in 2014, uh, only as a respond to the accusations of the West that the Russia conducts hybrid warfare. Uh, so the term itself is relatively new, but when you trace Russian discourse about the raw, the, the phenomenon of Gibrid Nevoina, as they define it, mm -hmm. it's very interesting because they have been uh, talking about that for more or less since the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Because uh, according to them, and, and by the way, it's not necessarily matter whether it's true or not, but Russians believe that they lost the Cold War. Uh, in uh, this kind of non-military confrontation which included economy and information and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, and they kind of, they're blaming uh, the West but they're also blaming the Soviet leadership which could face it or could respond uh, to the Western activities in that field. Uh, so what happened, and this is kind of, it's a known fact that uh, 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 the best uh, students of the previous war are usually those who uh, were defeated but not conquered. Mm. And, you can think about, and you can think about the example of Germany in the, in the, in the, in the interwar period. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what happened uh, to Russia is that they were defeated in the Second World, uh, in, sorry, in the Cold War, but they were not conquered, they were not integrated. Right. Uh, and if there was a period in initial, uh, in the first half of 90s, they were, uh, they were uh, trying to push themselves and say to the West, we lost, so please integrate us. 
uh, the West uh, wasn't uh, much ready for, uh, for that. Right. Uh, so the, once they realized that the, the door is closed, uh, they started uh, to uh, uh, look their own way. Uh, and uh, the, the first thing that they did uh, is to analyze their defeat. Why we, uh, what Russians would say, why we were defeated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and their ultimate answer was uh, uh, b- because of non-military confrontation. Mm-hmm. Uh, which included uh, diplomacy, economics, information, uh, and so on and so on. In Russia, compared to the West, um, as far as writing about these issues, is there a lot of freedom for disagreement and, and you know contrasting opinions, or is it more more controlled? Is there more? Well, of a... it, it's. Uh, it's complete freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's complete freedom of writing. It's uh, and Russians uh, have always uh, been, uh, uh, in terms of conceptual thinking, military thinking. They are very open. Even during the Soviet uh, during the Soviet time, uh, there were uh, relative openness to new ideas. There are stages. There are certain platforms where you can express your opinions, like journals. Uh, books and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's complete open writing, uh, and you can trace actually people who already started to write about that in the uh, early '90s, almost immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. which wasn't that popular. Uh, and also, the, uh, until today, you have much disagreement about not only about why the uh, Cold War ended. Um, but also what should be done now. So the, the, there is a very much freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. Russia, it's, this, is, this, is, this, is not, uh, this is not the issue. Okay. Uh, the issue is that they have been learning their, their lessons while the West uh, was in a kind of euphoria mm-hmm. of uh, uh, winning the... Uh, and you see that there is a problem that we define winning and losing. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, the end of the Cold War, everybody should won. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, but we kind of we successfully avoided a nuclear disaster. Mm-hmm. So, in my opinion, uh, the feeling should be that everybody won. But apparently, the West think that the West won. The Russians think that they lost. Mm-hmm. Now they try. Uh, they analyzed their their uh, their, uh, uh, their lessons. They learned their lessons, uh, and uh, this is uh, why they have an advantage, uh, as it seems uh, so far. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, was there a part of the research that was particularly enjoyable for you to do? Um, uh, <laughs> There was a there was a very interesting story. It's described in the book. So uh, I wanted to understand uh, when and how uh, the what Russians did in Crimea and in Ukraine was actually called hybrid warfare. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, because they started to do it was 2014. They did it. actually hybrid warfare. The, the concept itself was there for uh, eight years. Uh, so I tried to find, okay, how and who was the first to call them. There were several uh, people who uh, already in uh, April uh, 14 kind of tried to imply that this is hybrid warfare, but they, but they didn't catch. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> the first and most influential uh, source uh, was a short documentary mm-hmm. produced by NATO about why, what Russians did in Crimea. Mm-hmm. And the title that this, uh, the director of this documentary decided to give to, to this short documentary is uh, hybrid warfare. Mm-hmm. And then it basically was like a bushfire. And everybody, you can, I, I can actually trace 
the publications, everybody would refer to this documentary saying, look, NATO actually already calls it as a hybrid warfare. Mm-hmm. And I uh, uh, and I spoke with the with the with the director of this documentary in NATO. It was published by NATO, produced by NATO. Uh, and he's civilian. He's a civilian employed by NATO mm-hmm. magazine. I spoke with him and uh, asked him, okay, why did you call it hybrid warfare? You know, there was a whole uh, concept and the whole literature of what is hybrid warfare. Why did you call it like that? To what his response was, well, I I wasn't aware about anything written about hybrid warfare before. Hmm. Uh, it, it just seemed to be a combination of uh, regular or something different methods employed in the, in, the, in the, by Russians in Crimea, and hybrid sounds evil. <laughs> and then what happened immediately, like a bushfire. Hmm. Researchers all across Europe uh, started to write about that and make the connection, referring to this documentary as uh, acknowledgement of NATO that what Russians do is hybrid warfare. Uh, so basically, uh, hybrid warfare uh, uh, is popular because uh, one uh, director uh, uh, who just decided to give it a title. Yeah. An evil sounding title. <laughs> and it sounds evil. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so I know you went in to the research knowing about the differences that you would see, um, but did you find something that was particularly surprising to you as you went along? Um, well, um, it was, uh, I, I got some surprise uh, among, when, when I was researching Russian side. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, uh, I found this uh, ama- amazing. It's not not the right word. Uh, interesting guy uh, whose name is Messner. I have a chapter about him, Evgeny Messner. Mm-hmm. His uh, story is uh, very interesting. Uh, he was uh, born in the late 19th century. He was a, a Russian imperial officer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, during the Bolshevik Revolution, he was fighting with the uh, white movement against the Bolsheviks. Mm-hmm. And then he escaped uh, to Belgrade, uh, where he continued uh, his uh, uh, military service, or whatever you call it. He was teaching uh, in the officer uh, courses in Belgrade. Uh, also publishing and uh, engaging in uh, uh, research on military. Uh, and then during the Second World War, he joined the Wehrmacht to fight against the Soviets again. Hmm. Uh, and when uh, when he lost again, <laughs> uh, he uh, escaped to Argentina. Uh, where he continued his research uh, and publications and writing, trying to analyze his experience and uh, of both wars, uh, and uh, and we have the Cold War in in the background. Uh, so he was a very uh, conservative in his thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was very anti-communist. Uh, you have to remember he was publishing in Russian in Argentina mm-hmm. with very limited readership uh, so he his writings are very honest in terms of you know he was selling about 200 books mm-hmm. uh, so he, he didn't care about censorship or even self-censorship mm-hmm. uh, so he was very honest uh, sometimes it's very difficult to read he was very conservative very nostalgic uh, very much against any social changes uh, very much anti-communist uh, seeing this communist conspiracy everywhere uh, accusing the West of being weak in its fight against communism. Mm-hmm. Uh, he lost his uh, mother, motherland twice. Uh, 
to the to the Soviets and so on and so on. So obviously he wasn't known in the Soviet Union as right. you would expect. Okay. Uh, his books reached Soviet Union. He was they were collected in a restricted area in the National Library. Uh, I found them there in original copies. Mm -hmm. uh, Probably they were available for a very limited number of uh, high-level officials, officers, or I don't know. Uh, but they were forbidden for general public, obviously, or for general uh, general readership. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened? Now I'm jumping to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, what happened in the Soviet uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union? The Russian military lost its, its philosophy of war. And philosophy of war is very important. This is how you understand the reasons of war. Uh, and during the Soviet Union, it was explained by Marxism, Leninism ideology, uh, the struggle between classes, and so on and so on. Once the Soviet Union fell apart, Russian military find itself in a problem. They don't have an explanation to the very phenomenon of war. Uh, so they started to look and research, uh, and they went back to imperial writings, but also went back to uh, the writings of immigrants uh, who escaped after the Bolshevik revolutions to the West. And one of them was Messner, and apparently Messner has become to be very popular hmm. because in, 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 in the military circles. He was a, uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union in the last, what, 28, 27 years, he was uh, republished at least five, six, or maybe more times. Oh, wow. <laughs> different editions, different books, sometimes books by him on, uh, only his writings, sometimes as a collection of uh, different writers, but he was uh, quite widely republished. And uh, and what they're saying is, and it is interesting, like he was anti-communist, he was anti-Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what is uh, interesting, what they're saying, like, look, he was right. And what happened is that the West listened, because one of his arguments was that the Soviet Union employs different non-military means against the West. Propaganda, economics, uh, information, politics, ideology. The Soviet Union tried, uh, according to him, was trying to undermine the political establishment of the West. Mm -hmm. uh, so what the Russians are, are saying now is, look, yeah, he was right, but to the accuracy of 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. The West in the end, learned its lessons and employed what Messner was writing about against the Soviet Union. Hmm. Interesting. And, and this revival of Messner writings uh, across Russian political, professional, and military uh, uh, experts was one of the main reasons, or one of the foundation stones of this understanding which uh, in the end led to this idea of Gibridna huh. Vaina. Uh, in, in 2000s, more or less since the late 90s, until 2012 more or less, uh, there were several schools, we'll put it, several terms or several types of warfare, whatever you call it, the title doesn't matter. They all were talking about the same thing, about the blood. In a nuclear stalemate it, uh, combined with contemporary uh, technological and informational environment, non-military means and methods are much more effective. Mm -hmm. And their purpose is not to conquer, there is no purpose of conquering states anymore. 
Uh, it's even not to fight, it's just to undermine your, uh, the legitimacy of your, the political legitimacy of your adversary. Mm-hmm. Let, and then let them fight one with another. Mm-hmm. Inside, it's a, about weakening the cohesion of the adversary society. Yeah. Look and they, this kind of, they, they have, uh, they, they are free main uh, uh, school of conceptual thinking that I uh, identified in the book. One of them is Messer uh, uh, and his idea of subversion war. Uh, another one is uh, uh, Igor Panarin with his information war and uh, Alexander Dugin with his net-centric war. Uh, the titles are different. The mechanics and explanations are different, but on the bo- in the bottom line, they're all talking about the same thing. It's in, uh, undermining the legitimacy or, or the political legitimacy of your adversary, uh, and it's social political cohesion by non-military uh, means and methods. Mm-hmm. And this is what actually Gibrid Nevena is, according to Russians. Mm. So, because of nuclear weapons, there you know the big the big uh, states, nation states aren't going to attack each other externally. In, instead, you attack your enemy from within, and yeah. uh, watch them collapse. Yeah. Hmm. Well, but again, there is very little new in that conceptual thinking. Hmm. When you think about it, like uh, just as uh, a short trip to the history, uh, French did the same with Americans against the Brits. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, In the first years of American uh, American Revolution, Mm -hmm. uh, French were in peace with Britain. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brits did the same, uh, creating the Arab Revolt during the First World War. Mm -hmm. uh, Bolsheviks were supported by Germans. Yeah. United States has staged a uh, coup in, in Iran. Mm-hmm. So that there is a, once you don't once a state doesn't want to use uh, military means, and the, the reasons are it doesn't matter what are the reasons why a state doesn't want to fight military. Maybe it's incapable of. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's not ready. Maybe it's too weak. Maybe it's just not ready to bear the consequences. Mm-hmm. But once a state is not ready to fight military against an adversary or perceived adversary, employing non-military means and methods conceptually is a very old thing. Everybody was doing that. It makes me think of the Byzantine Empire. They had a small exactly, army. Exactly, exactly. You know, I didn't want to bring the uh, examples from uh, uh, ancient history, but you can go as far as you wish. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, now we have a slightly different technology. We have slightly different uh, information space. We have slightly uh, different economic uh, uh, tools that we can use. But the idea that, okay, we are not ready to fight it with weapons, let's try to do something else, uh, let's try to employ different means to undermine the, uh, the leader of the political establishment of my adversary, mm-hmm. it, it, it's very old trick. Uh, and by the way, the fact that we have Facebook now and the fact that we have global economy uh, does not necessarily make it easier. Hmm. Yeah. So, what do you hope the book will do? My hope is that the book will cool down the discourse. It will never happen. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the idea here uh, 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 of the book uh, is uh, A, to cool down. Like, not necessarily, it's not that we don't have a problem. It's not that we don't have a confrontation between the West and Russia, we do. Mm-hmm. But we have to approach this confrontation with much less emotions mm-hmm. and much more professionally 
And hybrid warfare, this old notion of hybrid warfare, this hybrid warfare narrative, it's all about emotions. Because politicians operate by, with emotions. Right. Uh, so if we want to solve the problem, and eventually we do want to solve the problem, and everybody wants to, in my, this is my belief, because the, you know, if you know, we don't want to solve the problem, then uh, we ultimately will find ourselves in 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 uh, uh, in other cold war or even worse, mm-hmm. uh, but to solve the problem, we have to cool down our emotions and approach it professionally. Understand? Okay, there is very little new in that. Uh, we have many historical examples when the same methods uh, were used. Uh, now, let's call things by their own names. Uh, we have espionage. We know how to deal with espionage. We have uh, economy. We know how to deal with economy. Uh, we have economic confrontation. We know how to deal with that. Uh, we have uh, political differences. We know how to. Do that. If we have military differences and we want to solve problem militarily, no problem. We know how to deal. This is why we pay so much money for our. Uh, departments of defense. Right. Uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's see the trees in the forest, not the forest. Right. So my hope is that it will uh, uh, cool down first, uh, and second, and this is kind of what I'm dealing with in the conclusions, uh, is uh, uh, to understand why uh, or where from. Uh, this hysteria is coming from uh, about all this Russian. Why? Why do we so much misunderstand them? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the problem is not with them. Usually, they are very good at uh, telling us what they are doing. Uh, Putin is very consistent in what he is saying. Each time we are surprised that actually he said and did. Uh, <laughs> But apparently, his signaling is very much obvious. Uh, so, the problem is with us. We lost uh, uh, our expertise in Russia for several reasons, which I explained in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one, uh, um, the second one is we have many problems with us. They all what the Russians are doing. Uh, it's basically uh, identifying our weaknesses mm-hmm. and adding a fuel into already existing fires. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, they're very good. They know us much better than we know them. Hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, they, they traveled much more. Uh, when you think about it, uh, in Russia, even in, let's say in Russian academia, to be promoted in academia, you have to spend time in the West. Hmm. Whether it's uh, to study degree or to some kind of visiting position, or and so on and so on and so on. Uh, the number of Western academics who go to Russia is limited to the Russian experts. Right. But an average Russian professor, let's say, in political philosophy, who is not expert on the Western political philosophy, he is just a professor in political philosophy, he would spend time in the West, a year or two, doing something. Mm -hmm. How many political philosophers uh, in the West spend time in Russia, who are not experts in Russia? Very few. And this is where it all begins. Huh. It's fascinating. This is, this is, you know, we have to understand them. Uh, and this is where it begins. It begins with philosophy and political philosophy. Yeah, oh, but ma- mathematics are important, but mathematics, they, you know, they, they all travel and speak with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, even during the Soviet times, they exchange among uh, uh, science, uh, like uh, hard science, uh, was very frequent. They, they, they were moving and exchanging and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. The problem with the social science, uh, how many psychologists 
who do not focus on Russia, Western psychologists who do not focus on Russia, spend time in Russia. Hmm. I don't know any. I assume that the number is very small, if at all. Right. And by the way, we will find the same problem uh, very soon if the confrontation with China will continue, we will start, find ourselves in the same situation. Yeah. Uh, we don't understand them uh, on a very basic uh, uh, basic level. Hmm. Uh, uh, so this is the first uh, uh, kind of uh, what I'm trying to achieve is kind of uh, in this book my hope is to then to understand the problem. We don't want second Cold War. Right. We it's not it's a hu- human beings on this planet. Cold War is a very expensive, uh, usually in terms of money, but also in terms of human lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thing we don't want to get there, but actually by talking about this hybrid warfare, we talk ourselves into it. Yeah, yeah, you can see that. So. <sighs> Can you uh, tell me any difficulties you had in finishing the book or getting it published and how you overcame those? Uh, no, it went uh, actually quite smooth. So yeah, I, would, I would not say that it was uh, uh, difficult uh, with the publisher uh, or something like that. Uh, initially, when I proposed uh, this project to, the, to my publisher, they liked it uh, in, uh, from the very beginning. Hmm. Uh, just to remind you, it was 2015, uh, uh, so when I kind of started to think about it, mm-hmm. late 2015, uh, so yeah, uh, it took me a year to write and a year to publish, so it was very quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, also probably because of the relevance of the book mm-hmm. to the ongoing uh, discourse. Uh, so no, no uh, I would say I didn't experience any significant uh, problems with that. Okay. Uh, what's your next writing project? Uh, actually, uh, now it's more kind of a continuation uh, from this project. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I already told you, there are some interesting uh, stuff that I figure out about r- Russian contemporary military thinking, or more importantly, what are the philosophical sources? Like, what is Russian Clausewitz? Yeah, obviously they read Clausewitz, but they have all their own Clausewitz. Mm-hmm. So actually several of them. Mm-hmm. And when I, uh, when I did this project and I read Russian uh, contemporaries uh, strategic thinking and uh, how they explain strategy and war uh, uh, and the interaction between uh, politics and military uh, I found out a very interesting uh, thing that uh, while in the West when you read the Western publications on Russian military uh, it, the research always begins with the Soviet Union mm-hmm. and then it usually will see will trace the transformation from the Soviet Union to Russian, uh, from the Soviet military to Russian military, and it doesn't necessarily matter whether we're talking about hardware or software in terms of thinking, whether we're talking about the military reforms in terms of the uh, how we use the forces or, mili- or kind of thinking, more philosophical kind of art of war uh, thinking. Mm-hmm. It's either transformation, or now it's very popular, the comeback. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of, they're coming back to the Soviet roots. Mm-hmm. But actually, when I read Russian publications, they uh, root their contemporary understandings uh, in three different schools of thinking. Uh, the first one is Soviet, yes, it's obviously there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Soviet uh, thinking uh, share equally, I would say, even uh, its place with Russian imperial thinking, mm-hmm. military, and 
military thinkers in exile. Hmm. Okay. In, in, now, what, what, what is interesting uh, here is that the last two, the Russian imperial military thinking, and uh, exile people who wrote in exile uh, uh, after the Bolshevik revolutions, they're completely out of the view of the Western experts. Hmm. Uh, because the basis for our contemporary Russian military studies in English uh, were written during the Soviet during the Soviet times, hmm. and in Soviet times these two schools were forbidden. So they left completely unnoticed by the Western experts who analyzed the Soviet military during the Cold War. Hmm, okay. And now on, when uh, uh, experts start to analyze Russia, they ultimately uh, go back to the Soviet, uh, Soviet times because uh, many of them just simply unaware of uh, this literature which have become uh, has become to be very popular in Russia in the last two decades mm. uh, so the idea is uh, to dig into this uh, kind of uh, on the one hand to try to analyze these schools of thinking uh, separately like what was the military thinking in the, late, in the late Russian Empire, second part of the 19th century, just before the uh, First World War, mm -hmm. uh, and then to analyze uh, separately what was uh, the common narratives uh, among the military officers who were right in exile uh, during the 30s, 40s, 60s, up to the 70s. Uh, and then to the prism of uh, like Soviet military thinking in uh, the literature in the West and Soviet military thinking is very rich so I don't need to dig into this okay. but then to, to, to try to take these three and uh, analyze their role and place uh, use them as a prism to analyze what Russians are doing now okay so so the current book, um, people can find that on Amazon and on Oxford University Press uh, website. Do you have um, do you have a personal website or anything that can, people can follow your thoughts or stuff? You're uh, I have I have, uh, I have my uh, page on academia.edu, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I, uh, if I publish something, uh, I either post it there if it's an uh, open. Uh, uh, open access, or I post a link uh, to an article uh, or any other publication that I publish. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, they can find me on academia.edu uh, very easily uh, and just uh, to follow. Okay. Um, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Well, <laughs> actually. Uh, as a final word, I will read the annotation uh, uh, of the book, The First Two Lines, okay. which actually do not belong to me, they belong to George Orwell. Hmm. Uh, but if the thoughts uh, corrupt language, language can also corrupt thoughts. A bad usage can spread by tradition and imitation even among people who should and do know better. Hmm. Uh, and this is what is a hybrid warfare uh, uh, the language of hybrid warfare uh, is about. Mm -hmm. It's a circle where the language corrupts our thinking, and our thinking corrupts our language. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a closed circle, uh, and uh, to find a solution, we have to break it, uh, approach the problem with much more professional and sober understanding stop being emotional uh, and uh, solve the problem all right well thank you for speaking with me uh, thank you very much thank you for listening one of the best ways to provide feedback 
on this podcast is to rate it on iTunes. Please let me know if you liked it or give me a poor rating if you didn't like this podcast and I can use that feedback to hopefully get better. Otherwise, please follow me on Instagram at Chris Alvarez War Scholar on YouTube under War Scholar 1945 on Twitter at War Scholar on Facebook under War Scholar and you can find more information on my website warscholar.org please remember my name Chris does not have an H so it's C-R-I-S A-L-V-A-R-E-Z Thank you, and I hope you continue to enjoy this podcast.